This morning we studied the duty of the eldership to the membership, and there were a number of things in that sermon that were general comments. We weren't going into details on all of them, but we looked at how the, the elders are taught in the scriptures to feed and oversee the flock and just exactly what that means. If they're to watch for wolves or false teachers or those that would ravage the flock, and that they are to exercise discipline, lead the church in discipline where it needs to be done, and they're to live exemplary lives before the members and one another. This afternoon I said we would talk about the membership, its duty to the eldership. In order for members of a congregation to have a happy and harmonious relationship with each other, and in order for them to work and function as God would have them to do, there are at least two essential things that ought to exist and must exist. First of all, The members must recognize the place and purpose of the eldership. That was hopefully the basic purpose behind the lesson this morning. But the second one is this. They must recognize their duties to the eldership. It works for both. Each understanding, we're talking about what the Lord's will is. For, as far as the eldership is concerned to the church and then the church to the eldership. We're not trying to just make up things here or to make it more tough on one than the other. We're simply saying what is Jesus Christ's will for his church, his organization in these two areas? Well, first of all, it is the duty of the membership to the eldership to know the elders and to esteem them highly for their work's sake. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 12 and 13, Paul said to the church of Thessalonica, But we beseech you, brethren, to know them that labor among you and are over you in the Lord, and admonish and to esteem them exceeding highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Sometimes when we're praying for brethren to love one another, understanding as brothers and sisters in Christ, we've all heard the same gospel, we've all believed it, we've all obeyed it, We all wanted forgiveness of our sins, reconciliation to God, fellowship with God and one another. And we want to be in heaven with one another in a glorified state forevermore. We want that kind of fellowship. Well, if we're to have it, then we have to understand the church, and that means understand its organization. And this means then that we understand our relationship one with another. Paul is implying that there is a direct connection in this passage I'm talking about between the peace and harmony of a congregation and that congregation's disposition of mind, perspective, or attitude toward those that are over them in the Lord. And if that's not the elders, then I don't know who that would be. It doesn't mean that the elders are some sort of people who are better than anybody else. It means it's due to the very nature of their work and the peace and harmony that ought to exist where people are working together. Members are to know the elders. What does it mean? Well, it means they know who they are. It means, of course, they know their names and faces and More than this, it means they know the New Testament's teaching of the responsibility of elders. What do you as a member have a God-given right to expect out of the eldership over a congregation? 
I think I've mentioned at times over the years, people moving into town have uh, maybe phoned the office, talked to the preacher or whatever, and asked about what, uh, what do you all offer to our young people, to our children, to us? Well, I think one of the questions to turn that around would be, well, what do you bring to this congregation? Do you bring an understanding of what the church really is as it's taught on the pages of the New Testament? Do you understand the organization of it? Do you understand the difference in your own personal family and its responsibilities from that of the family of God? Do you know all of those things? Are you willing to submit to the authority of Christ as presented in the rightly divided word of Christ that we might be what we ought to be? Members need to know the elders as friends. They need to know them as spiritual counselors. They need to know them from the standpoint of, I know what God expects of those men. The membership out of a heart of genuine love is to highly respect the eldership simply because of the nature of the elders' work. There's no way to say this other than, I guess, the way I'm going to say it. <laughs> Maybe somebody can do a better job. But when you become an elder, and the only way I, as a preacher over the years, had any more of a relationship with them than other members was because of what the preacher's work is, working closer with the elders, I was brought in on things at times that maybe the members in general wouldn't be unless it particularly concerned them personally. But when you are in an eldership and you go for a while, then you learn a number of things about people. And those people have a right for you to respect them when they come to you and talk to you. That you're going to deal with them as the Bible says. That you've got their best interest, that is their soul salvation at heart. That you also are concerned about protecting them. Why shouldn't shepherds of the flock want to protect the flock in all that, spiritually speaking, that means? A membership has a right to expect that out of its elders. The membership is to cooperate with the eldership, and they're to cause the elders as few problems as possible. Second, it is the duty of the membership to the eldership to honor the elders and be slow to criticize them. Now, I don't know of any eldership, individual elder, whatever, that uh, you couldn't criticize and be right in some of it. Now, I'm not talking about elders sinning and treating them as the need to repent. I'm talking about the fact that most of their decisions are made in the area where the Lord has not specified a certain thing. We've spent a lot of time around here, not so much lately, but we have everywhere I've preached over the many years when I was in preacher's training school or showing the importance of having Bible authority, especially New Testament authority for everything that we believe in practice, Colossians 3.17. The church has a right to expect the elders to act on that basis. If they don't expect the elders to do that, what do they expect the elders to do? But as they do so, the elders are then considering the various options whereby they can discharge those obligations that God has placed upon the church which obligations we know because we know how the Bible authorizes. When I say we, I mean every member of the church ought to. And yet, there are babes in Christ. There are weak members. The Bible even addresses how that you deal with weak members. Paul did in the book of Romans. But one thing about it, he never expected a weak member to always be weak. <laughs> the idea is that they grow and they mature. Same thing's true, of course, as a babe in Christ. 
as a newborn babe desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. Now, shouldn't elders, in view of them being shepherds, recognize the differences in the spiritual growth and needs of a congregation and the people in it? Well, they surely should. If they're pastors, and that's the way pastor is used in the scriptures to be another term for elders. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, Paul says, especially those who labor in the word and teaching. Then he went ahead to say, Against an elder receive not an accusation except at the mouth of two or three witnesses. 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 19. And I mentioned that latter part this morning. There must be some protection for those who have the superintendency of a congregation. Men who have been qualified and are qualified. And they know what the work of elders are and they know what the work of the church is. How could you do the work of elders and not know what the work of the church is? How could you do the work of shepherds of the flock and not know the difference in the shepherds or the flock, I should say, and the obligations God places upon husband and wife, mama and daddy? Shouldn't elders understand the difference in the three great institutions that God has set up? The home, marriage in the home, the concept of civil government, and the church. One of the problems with Roman Catholicism is that Rome wanted to run it all. They wanted to run the home and the church. Well, the elders certainly are concerned about how a home conducts itself. But there are no elders that are ahead of other people's houses. As the Bible describes a scriptural husband being head of his own house. Yet the elders are expected to see that members under their superintendency understand the responsibility of homes and the fathers and mothers and children. But they understand, for example, practicing pure and undefiled religion to visit the widows and orphans and their affliction. Visit their means to supply the needs of orphans. They don't have parents. Or to supply the needs of widows. They don't have husbands. Well, that means somebody's got to realize that the church can't be a home, but it's expected to practice pure and undefiled religion. Thus, there must be some set up to take care of the orphans. They don't have a mom and daddy. And watch it. Once the natural home's destroyed, folks, listen, it's forever destroyed. Thus, orphans, when they're taken care of, a legal term is, it's in loco parentis, in the place of parents. In the place of parents. Which means that whoever's doing that, more than likely in most civil governments are going to have to be qualified by those civil governments to do it. That's why there's licensed foster homes, licensed child care facilities. All other things being scripturally equal, those things must be met. Because it's a part of civil government where to obey civil government where it doesn't cause us an obedience to violate God's will. All those things have to be taken care of. Elders have to understand that. To know the difference in the home God set up, and how it was set up, and how it's to function, and in the church, and the civil government. Let me see if I can show it this way. A man might be president of a bank, an elder, And, of course, a father. He has to be as the elder. He's wearing three different hats. He's not the president of a bank over his home. He's the husband and father in the home. And you go ahead and make the relationship on down the line. 
elders have to understand that. We wouldn't have had a lot of the problem we had 80 years ago when the anti-orphan home, anti-cooperation thing started and split the church through the 50s and early 60s, still divided to this day. If people had understood some of those things. I attended a debate, which I moderated in part of it, over in College Station while I was at uh, Southwest in Austin. And after the debate was over, we were in the Antis building, if you want to call it that, real nice building. And he did not believe, that was one of the things being discussed, that a non-member of the church benevolently could be helped out of the church treasury. That was a sin. I asked him as we stood there, very pleasant fellow. Well, this man was an elder. I said, you don't have to talk about it. The debate's over. But I said, I'd like to talk with you about it. He said, yeah, I don't mind talking about it. I said, am I right when I assume that this land and this building was purchased by money out of the church treasury? Oh, yeah, it was. I said, what if you had a tornado? Now, we've seen a few of those. And this building was the only one that was left standing with electricity on and so forth. Would you allow it to be used as an emergency facility and people hurt all around the community? Be brought in here and maybe they're laid on the pews and... All your paramedics are working and so forth on it. Would you allow that? I'm not talking about members of the church. I'm talking about anybody hurting in need. Why, yes, we would. I said, all right, now you keep that in mind. I said, the finances of the church is either liquid assets or it's material assets, hard assets. You've already said the money that bought this land and built this building was converted from liquid assets to hard assets. And yet you say out of the church treasury you cannot benevolently help somebody who's not a member of the church. And you just told me as a hard asset you could. And that's what he said. And he stood there. I don't think I can quite act out the way he did. But when I said that, he didn't say anything. He just stared up at the ceiling for a long time. And that's the way the conversation ended. If people would learn to think on these things when it came to marriage in the home, one institution, Civil government, one institution, the church. And yet the church is to practice pure and undefiled religion. James 1.27. And it can't help non-saints out of the church treasury. But with him, you couldn't if it was liquid assets. But you could if you'd been converted to hard assets and non-members were laid out on the bench and the blood on the carpet and whatever else is going on. You could help then. Well, of course he couldn't answer it. He was between a rock and a hard place. But he was held in the church. And that's gone on for years. And it's still that way among these folks. Elders have an obligation to be schooled in the issues of the day to know what's going on, to pay attention to what's going on. I've been too many places over the years. And I've actually seen people in red <laughs> when you try to bring up something, well, that's not bothering us here. Why do we need to know about that? They don't use that kind of thinking. when it, Usually they don't. Let's put it that way. When it comes to their own physical well-being or their own needs for their own, let's say, insurance on their own house or, or car or health insurance, Many other things. So when you start talking about elders, the members need to know that the elders understand these things and they can depend on them 
And then they need a course themselves. Nothing substitutes for your own personal study and knowledge. And to realize what is happening. So the responsibility of elders is no light or easy responsibility. Often they meet. I remember one time daddy served as an elder for many years. <laughs> he said we met so much about things. He said I'm just about to and move into the building. <laughs> well there are things that are going on. There are things that are happening. And you have to meet and discuss it. One thing that's nice about modern day technology is that Zoom helps us do some meeting at times that we don't have to come to the building to meet or to one another's houses. And that helps. But there has to be some things discussed. I don't think the ordinary member, and I don't mean to say they're dumb, that's not the point, but they don't give thought to the details of things that go on, but they ought to. Sometimes, and I'm glad it's not all the time, there are meetings where you just have to wrestle with problems that are involving a member of the church or members of the church. And those are sometimes long meetings. And sometimes elders, according to their jobs, have already put in a long day at work and they have to meet on something along this line. I would say this so far. If you're thinking about being an elder like the New Testament teaches, how much of your time beyond your secular work are you willing to put in? Because it can demand on those things. I also know of a situation where a man was appointed an elder. He didn't last hardly a year because they were having to have meetings. His wife didn't like it waiting outside for him to get through meeting after things. Well, there's a lot wrong with that. But he resigned simply because of all that extra meeting. Wasn't that something? In most instances, an elder gets no pay for his work as an elder. And too much of the time, he gets little appreciation from the members. We ought to be careful about that. Because I promise you, elders doing their work, they deal with things that the members in general will not know about. It's the way it ought to be when it is called for. So no wonder the Bible urges Christians to honor. That, is, that just simply means respect the elders. Be especially slow in receiving the accusation against them or criticizing them. I guess it could spend a long time, and I know John could, because he's worked as a preacher for a long time, that, of just listening to the things. One of the things that you have to teach preachers, and this is what we did in preacher training school, is be wary of those folks in the congregation that want to get you on their side. If I ever went out to a gospel meeting, and it's happened, and I'm there the first day, and one of the members comes up and says, I'd like to have breakfast with you on Tuesday morning at 7. Are you free? You know, oh, I, I'm, I'm climbing down in the tank at that time and about to pull the lid down. Well, you're paranoid. No, I'm real, realistic. <laughs> nine times out of ten, and I think I'm being fair in saying nine times out of ten, they're wanting to try something out on you, and most of the time it has to do with elders. And I've had that happen more than once. And you have to measure every word. Members of the church then are to appreciate the work of elders. And they do make certain sacrifices. Characteristic of God-fearing elders, men who are conscientiously going about the performance of their duties to the best of their abilities. Now, I, I'll be the first one to say there are no flawless elders. They don't exist. There's no flawless anybody in the church. Flawlessness does not equate with faithfulness. Because there's always room. Anything God enjoins upon us as a member of the church, whether it's elders or deacons or whatever, you can grow in it. You can develop in it. But you're faithful 
as you grow. People need to understand the difference in that. It is also the duty of the membership to the eldership, to, as I said this morning, to obey them and submit to them. I mentioned Hebrews 13, 17, but I'll read it again. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves to them, for they watch in behalf of your souls. Underscore that. They watch in behalf of your souls. As they that must give account that they may do this with joy and not with grief. For this is unprofitable to you. Hebrews 13, 17 again. If, if what the elders decide to do in discharging a given obligation that God by his authoritative word is placed upon the church. Doesn't sit quite with the way you would do it. Just remember this. If you had had the final decision, it probably wouldn't sit with somebody else just exactly the way you like to do it. Somebody has to have the final say. It's always been that way in every organization I know of. In fact, I don't know how any organization functions if it doesn't have somebody with the final say so. Now, I'm not talking about lording it over the flock. If you lord it over the flock, you're saying, I don't care what you think or what you do or who you are. This is the way it's going to be. That's not the idea at all. Because in making those decisions that elders make, they have to understand the members. They have to know the members. So the members must not be found, or else Hebrews 13, 17 doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense. They must not be found to rebel against the eldership. And really, they become guilty of spiritual anarchy. So elders are God's appointed pastors for directing the affairs of a congregation. As long as eldership is leading the church in accord with God's word, then the membership has a divine obligation to be submissive and obedient to the elders in the area I mentioned. Let me say this, before members reject a program of work set forth by the elders, they need to be very sure that it's a program that's contrary to the authority of the scriptures, rather than simply contrary to their customs or traditions or human opinions. Now, I don't think there's some people <laughs> that have learned the difference. In fact, I know there's not in some places. I don't think we got, I'll be fair about it. I'm speaking as objectively as I know how as a human being. I can't read your mind like God does. I don't think we have people in this congregation like that now. I think we have. I don't know of a congregation that hasn't. But it's not right when it exists. Perhaps it's in order to point out again, though I mentioned it this morning, that the word submit means simply to be in subjection to. Now, move it over into the realm of the home. The husband, the father is the head of the house. And he loves his wife as the weaker vessel. And as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. The wife is to submit to her husband. Well, does that mean she's to be treated like some sort of dog when he doesn't love her? That he can expect out of her things that are actually sinful in her conduct? Of course not. It means submitting in the way that a wife should, as the Bible teaches wives are to be. Not just simply because somebody desires to make you a doormat. Never was meant to be that way. Well, bringing it over to the Lord's church, some members go along with the elders as long as they, the members, agree with the elders. But to submit to the elders means to be in subjection to them even when one may not necessarily see eye to eye with them on every detail. Let me ask you something. 
in a home, in a loving home, in the arrangement God set out in the Bible of the husband and the wife. The wife is to submit to her husband. And the husband is to rule out of love. Do you think on every single solitary item that the wife's going to say, that's the way I would have done it if left up to me. Why am I seeing these funny looks on people's faces? But if she's what the Bible says she ought to be, and he's not made decisions that's going to cause her to sin, and sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4, and yes, she submits. And she also knows how to say, is this really what you want to do? Or maybe, have you considered this? Not a thing in the world wrong with that. Not a thing in the world wrong. In fact, I don't know if a loving husband wouldn't appreciate suggestions of a wife. Wives can be wise, you know. They can be well-meaning and desiring the same thing for that home that a godly man does. I would, I would think that good wives sometimes have kept their husbands from getting in a mess. But it can all be done with proper respect and still submission. And it can be done that way when it comes to members of the church and the elders. Again, let me emphasize, somebody in God's infinite wisdom, he knew this, had to have the final say-so in matters of expediency in the church. Somebody had to. Now, if it's not the elders, who's it going to be? Somebody will. It's a lot better to do it the Lord's way. Another point is, is the duty of the membership, the eldership, to imitate the elders' faith. And that's of course, ties in somewhat with this morning because elders must demonstrate their concern for the doctrine of Christ and acting only as they're authorized to act in their particular conduct, wherever they are. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation, their manner of life, Hebrews 13, verse 7. Elders are in that position, or should be, because of their faithfulness. In fact, any work of a member in the church means that they should be faithful or they shouldn't be in it. Think about it. He that be greatest among you, let him be your servant. Who should be greatest among you, the talker or the servant? <laughs> it's because of what you're doing, the truth put into practice. And one of the qualifications of an elder is that he must be a man holding to the faithful word which is according to the teaching, Titus chapter 1, verse 9. Now, if you don't know how to ascertain Bible authority or how the Bible authorizes, you don't know the difference in some of the things we've been talking about when it comes to the home, civil government, and the church, then you're going to fall off a pit somewhere. And since only faithful men are to be chosen as elders, it's safe for the members to imitate their faith as they imitate Christ. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1. That's what Paul said. Follow me as you see Christ living in me. That means every individual must be studying the Bible, of course, for himself or herself. But look at the qualifications of elders. Wouldn't they be somebody you would want to follow? Does that mean they're perfect? In the sense, no room for growth and development. Can't you just see some church somewhere say, we got the best elders in the world. They don't. They have reached it. They don't have to grow anymore. I can't, I can't imagine that. Our elders are right where they ought to be. They don't have to grow anymore. Well, I never thought that to myself as a preacher, certainly not as an elder. There are insights you can get into things, an understanding. There's nothing else to say. We're not going to do that again. <laughs> Have you ever thought about that when it comes to the home? Husbands and wives trying to figure out what to do that's best. An eldership that recognizes this duty to the membership 
is happily engaged in discharging the same. And a membership that recognizes this duty of the eldership and is, we can say, joyously engaged in the discharge of the same constitute an unbeatable combination. It's all because we're willing to do it as God says. We're willing to understand that. And it's all because we love one another and have respect for the organization God set up, for the qualifications he's laid down, whether it's elders or deacons or preachers or whoever it may be. Now, again, you'll notice even as this morning was quite a bit of, there's some specificity, but I'm giving you general things. And you know what comes out of both of these sermons? Most every problem we talked about or could be coming up would be solved simply if brethren, whether elders or deacons or preachers or any member, Bible class teacher, just would have the right attitude toward God themselves and their own brethren in Christ. That's why John says over and over again, little children love one another. It's not some sort of sick, syrupy, romanticized thing. It's emotionalism. It is a respect for the truth of God and that we're all striving for the same thing, to please God by obedience to his will, that heaven will be our home. That's faithfulness. And Paul said we walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Now that covers being elders. It covers being preachers. It covers being deacons, Bible class teachers, husbands, wives, mamas and daddies, and so on. We walk by faith and not by sight. But faith comes by hearing the word of God. If we walk by faith and not by sight, and faith comes by hearing the word of God, then we're letting the word of God guide us and lead us and direct us. And we're growing in the knowledge of the truth in every one of these areas in the church, bound together by a common bond that says we want to serve Christ and we realize the differences in all of us in our growth and development in Christ. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, we plead with you by the mercies of Christ to become one. And in your mind, acquiescing to His will. That's what you're going to do the rest of your life because He knows the way from earth to heaven. Christ, as it were, has blazed the trail. He's already gone through. Remember, be of good cheer, for I've overcome the world, He told His apostles. Well, there's nobody else can say that. And through the gospel of Christ, God's power to save we begin our journey in being baptized into Christ as penitent believers. The child of God, if you've sinned, we urge you to repent of it and pray God for forgiveness. And if you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come to Him while we stand and sing.